Amen. So, Revelation chapter 14. Keep something there in Revelation chapter 14. We'll be coming back to that. And uh, go ahead and turn back to Revelation chapter 7. I want to talk uh, this morning a little bit about the 144,000. The title of the sermon is The Example of the 144,000. I think there's some things that we can learn about these uh, unique individuals in the book of Revelation, the 144,000 that we can apply to our own lives. And uh, I kind of, so I just kind of want to take a look uh, at them this morning and, and see what we can get out of it. But uh, whenever we deal with this uh, this group of people, the 144,000, you kind of have to, you can't really touch on the subject without dispelling this false doctrine that's out there that's taught by Jehovah Witnesses in particular, that the 144,000 are this elite group of believers, that they're the only people that get to go to heaven, this kind of teaching that's out there. So I kind of had to touch on that in the beginning of the sermon, but towards the end of the majority of the sermon, the majority of the sermon I just kind of want to spend making an application about some of the attributes of these 140,000 uh, men that we can apply to our own lives. But the first thing we have to get here is the timing or the context of where these men are in prophecy. What point do they show up? Now if we were to uh, read the whole you know, scripture and get it in context, we would see that they show up after the sixth, after the sixth deal and prior to the seventh seal. So you have the, the first you know, seven seals, and then you have the trumps and the vials. Those are two distinct um, parts of the timeline in, in Revelation. And the, the 144,000, they show up here in Scripture in between that sixth and seventh seal, just before God begins to pour out His wrath. So it says there in verse 3 of Revelation chapter 7 and verse 1, uh, <clears throat> well, let's just begin in verse 1, excuse me. It says, And after these things I saw four angels standing in the four corners of of the earth, holding the four winds of the earth, that the wind should not blow on the earth, nor on any sea, nor on any tree. And I saw another angel ascending from the east, having the seal of the living God, and he cried with a loud voice to the four angels, to whom it was given to hurt the earth and the sea, saying, Hurt not the earth, neither the sea, nor the trees, till we have sealed the servants of our God in their foreheads. And I heard the number of them which were sealed, that were sealed and 144,000, of all the tribes of the children of Israel. So you have to see there, look there in verse 3 where it says, saying, the angel tells them to hurt not the earth, neither the sea nor the trees, until we have sealed the servants of our God in their, fore, in their foreheads. Now, this is what happens, this hurting of the earth and of the trees and of the seas, that's what happens after the seventh seal is opened. And we know chapter 6 is, you know, the, the opening of the sixth seal. So now here we are in chapter 7, where he says, don't hurt the earth, don't hurt the seas, don't hurt the trees which is what takes place um, after the fact. At when the seven seals open and the seven trumps of God begin to sound. It says there in Revelation chapter 8, verse 1, And when he opened the seventh seal, there was silence in heaven about the space of half an hour. And I saw the angel, the seven angels which stood before God, and to them were given trumpets. Right. So we see the 144,000, and then we see that seventh seal being opened, and the seven angels giving the seven trumpets and the seven vials of the wrath of God. Now, uh, we could uh, further prove this if we look there in Revelation chapter 7, or excuse me, Revelation chapter 8, beginning at verse 6, and the seven angels which had uh, the seven trumpets prepared to sound. The first angel sounded, and what happened there? It says towards the end, and the third part of the trees was burnt up and on the green grass. Look at verse 8. The second angel sounded. Look towards the end there. The part of the sea became blood. And then it says there in verse 10, and the third angel sounded, and there at the ver end of verse 11, and the third part of the waters became wor wormwood, and many men died of the waters because they were made bitter. So we see it's the perfect sequence there. They say don't hurt uh, the sea or the trees or the earth until we seal the seven uh, our, our servants, the 144,000 in the foreheads. They do that, and then the vials get poured out, and what's the first things that get hurt? The earth, the sea, and the trees. So that's the timing of it right there. That's when they show up in scriptures between that sixth and seventh seal. Now, what we really want to deal with more than so than the timing is the identity of the 144,000. Who are these men? Who are these people that have such a unique uh, uh, place in scripture? And uh, is Karen available? No, she's not. You just have her give me some more. Yeah, perfect. He's a minor here. He knows what I need before I even ask sometimes. So, uh, What's more important than that is the identity of the 144,000. Who are they? Well, it's really clear who they are. I mean, there's really no mystery about it. It's uh, you know, it's not God that's made it a confusing subject. It's man that likes to you know muddy these waters and make this hard to understand and try right. to confuse people about this. The yeah. Bible is really clear about who these people are, and it's clear about who they aren't. Now, 
We agree uh, here that it is not a it is not symbolic. You'll hear some people say, "Well, the 144,000 it's just symbolic of all believers. It's just representative of the whole church, and they're just taking a very figurative interpretation of who the 144,000 are." Just like they like to say that John in uh, chapter four being called up into heaven is a, is the is the uh, picture of the church being raptured. Even though it says he was caught up in the spirit, you know, and his body remained on the earth where the rapture is, you know. The whole body and the spirit of the body being kind of together. Amen. So that you know, that's kind of a, a lot of ways people interpret that is they'll say, well, it's symbolic. But we don't we don't believe that. We believe this is a literal 144,000 men. You know, the Bible's real clear, real clear about this. Um, and you know, we're quick to make that point, but so are the, J, the JWs, the Jehovah Witnesses. If you ever knock on their door, I know we knocked on the door uh, a month or two back, and the lady she brought up 144,000. And without me even saying anything, she's like, and those are that's a literal number. You know, she's they make a, they're really quick to let you know because they get criticized a lot for this doctrine, and they should because they're they're completely wrong about it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so we agree with the Jehovah Witnesses that this is a literal group. Okay, we'll give them that. We'll throw them a bone. Okay, this is a literal group of men numbering 144,000. However, that's about that's all we agree with about them in regards to this. Right. Uh, we strongly disagree with Jehovah Witnesses. As to the identity of the, who those literal 144,000 people are, so the Jehovah Witnesses, what they teach erroneously is that the 144,000 are an elite group of faithful believers. And if you would turn over to keep something Revelation, turn over to First Peter chapter one. First Peter chapter one. They think that they'll tell you that it is an elite group of people, elite group of believers who make it into heaven. Now, I'm going to read to you from their article. I didn't print it off this time. You know, I didn't want to you know, waste the limited ink that I had anyway. But it says if you were to go to jw.org and go to the and go to uh, the go to the article entitled Who Go to Heaven. Now if you, and now I sound like you know kind of stupid saying it that way, but that's how it's written on there. Who go to heaven? So they could even think. I'm going to say it like that because that's the typo on their website. It should be who goes to heaven, but it says who go to heaven. So if I want to get you to the right source in your article, you have to look up who go to heaven. Okay, not who goes to heaven. So that, that's not a knock on them. You know, we all make typos. Hopefully we, we get it before we publish it on the web. But uh, it says here in that article entitled who go to heaven on jw.org, God selects a limited number of faithful Christians who after their death will be resurrected to life in heaven. Once they have been chosen, so it's not enough to God to just choose you. First you have to be chosen by God, right? And once they have been chosen, they must continue to maintain a Christian standard of faith and con conduct in order not to be disqualified from receiving their heavenly inheritance. So they're literally teaching here, you know, according to their doctrine, one for, must first be chosen by God, then maintain a standard of faith and conduct in order to enter into heaven. And they cite 1 Peter chapter 1, where I had you turn. This is their proof text. It says 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 3, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, which according to His abundant mercy hath begotten us again unto a lively hope by the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, to an inheritance incorruptible and undefiled, and that fadeth not away reserved in heaven for you. So there you go. It's crystal clear that God chooses people, right? And that, that they must maintain a standard of, 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 uh, of faith and practice in order to be worthy of that calling. Now, in, you know, anyone who just reads over that doesn't walk away with that interpretation. No. Someone has to tell you that. That's why they just put the reference there. They don't actually quote the scripture and you know, expound upon it in these articles. They'll just make their statement, whatever false doctrine they want to teach, and they just quote. They'll just put the reference in there. Hoping that you won't actually take the time to go and read it, have, you know, and actually read for yourself what it's saying. <clears throat> now we do want to break this down. Okay, if they did quote the scripture, well, let's break it down a little bit. Let's break down First Peter chapter one. First of all, it says there in verse four that we come to an inheritance in heaven. Okay, that we are come to an inheritance in heaven. Now, how do we get to that inheritance in heaven? It says that in verse three. It says by having been begotten, right, born again. That's how you come to the inheritance. Not by having a standard of Christian conduct. Right. That's not what the scripture is teaching here. It says that we come to the inheritance in heaven by having been begotten by the resurrection of Jesus Christ. 
That's how I'm going to heaven. That's how I'm going to get there. It's because I've been uh, born again by putting my faith in the uh, death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. Amen. It's not because God chose me. It's not going to be because you know I've lived a certain standard of Christian conduct in my life that I've been good enough in order to earn my way into heaven. That's not how I'm getting there. And anybody who believes that they're going to work their way into heaven by their own good works is going to split hell wide yes. open. Amen. People that teach this doctrine are teaching a false gospel. Mm -hmm. They're teaching you that you have to work your way into heaven. It says there, furthermore, in verse 4, that that inheritance is reserved in heaven for you. It's not earned, it's reserved. Now think about this. You know, Have you ever reserved anything? Have you ever reserved a seat somewhere? You're, you know, you ever reserve, call the head to a, a, maybe a nicer restaurant and say, hey, I'm going to show up with, and at a certain time and I expect this many seats to be waiting for me. And they'll say, well, yeah, no problem. We'll just make sure you, you know, that when you get here, you've been, you've been behaving. And we'll see. We'll talk to somebody. And if you've had a good day, maybe we'll let you sit down. That's not how reservations work. Yeah. Now, you think about a guy who buys season tickets to, to, to some sporting event. I mean, he's guaranteed a seat. He's guaranteed. He's expecting when he walks into that arena or stadium that he's going to be able to go to a section and find a seat because he paid money. It's reserved for him. You know, he doesn't show up there and they're, they're asking, well, you know, have you been paying your taxes? Have you been late to work? You know, you've been reading your Bible? You know, have you been a good boy? All right, then we'll let you have these seats that are reserved. That's not how reservations work. And the Bible says that these seats in heaven, our place, our inheritance in heaven, is reserved for us by the resurrection of Jesus Christ. It's not earned. It's not something that we have to wonder about. It's something that we know is there. In fact, if you would, turn over to Ephesians chapter 2. Ephesians chapter 2. Our inheritance is reserved in heaven. In fact, the Bible talks about our seat in heaven being so sure, it speaks of it as if we're already there. Amen. It talks about it as if we're already sitting in heaven. It's so we're, We can have such confidence and be so sure of the fact that our reservation is there in heaven. Our heavenly seat is there. The Bible talks about it as if we're already there. Look here in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 4. But God, who is rich in mercy, for His great love wherewith He loved us, even when we were dead in sins, hath quickened us together with Christ, by grace are ye saved, and hath raised us up together and made us sit. That's past tense. He has already made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. So again, who is it? How is it that we get to this inheritance? Well, it's God who loves us when we, when He hath quickened us, when we were dead in sins. He already quickened us. It wasn't what we did. It's what He did. And hath raised us up together. And what does He do? He makes us sit. He's the one that makes us sit. He doesn't just say, well, there might be a seat for you. He says He has made us to sit together in heavenly places Amen. with Christ Jesus. Amen. And why? Why does God make it so easy? Why does God say, make it so easy that he, he does all the work to get us there and reserves that seat in heaven for us and makes us to sit in heavenly places? Why is it that He extends such mercy towards us? We'll look at verse 7. That in the ages to come He might show the exceeding riches of His rich of his, the riches of His grace in His kindness toward us through Jesus Christ. I mean, that's the purpose of it. That when we get to heaven and we're seated there, we will all know that the only reason we got there was because of the riches of His grace. Right. Not our own merits, not our own works, not what we have done. Not because like the JWs that think they're going to you know, earn their way in there. That they're going to somehow live a life that's worthy enough and pleasing enough to God in order to go to heaven. We'll understand that it was by the resurrection of Christ, that it was by the riches of His grace, and that it was by His goodness that we're there. And we'll know that for how long? Through, the, through all the ages to come. That's what we'll be. We'll be like God. We'll be show and tell for God for the ages to come. To say, this is an example of my, the riches of my mercy, my grace, and my goodness. I have made these sinners, these who were dead in their sins, I have quickened them and sat them together with me in heaven for all eternity. Amen. <clears throat> now, if you would, I should have had you just keep something there in 1 Peter chapter 1. I apologize, but if you would go back to 1 Peter chapter 1. This article, if you notice... They, they reference 1 Peter 1, verses 3 and 4. They conveniently leave off verse 5. Because verse 5 is kind of a, kind of throws it right back in their face. <laughs> Notice it says here, how do you get, how is it that, okay, okay, the, the reservation's there, we have the, the seat in heaven, but you know, how are we, are we sure that it's going to always be there for us? We'll look at verse 5 of 1 Peter 1. Who are kept by the power of God through faith unto salvation 
See, it's God that keeps us. We don't have to earn our way there. Yeah. We don't have to wonder whether or not we're ever going to make it, whether or not we're going to be good, up, good enough to make it. The Bible says that we are kept by the power of God through faith. It's God that's going to keep us there. You know, and if, and if this weren't the case, if there, somehow you know, this promise weren't true, then Jesus is a liar. If what the Jehovah's Witnesses are teaching here, then Jesus is a liar. Because Jesus said in John 14, Let not your heart be troubled. Ye believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you, I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there ye may be also. And whither I go, you know, and the way you know. Jesus promised that he was going to come again and receive us that we might be where he is. That's the promise of God. Amen. So if, if what the Jehovah's Witnesses are teaching is true, then we have to earn our way there, then we're not sure that it's there, that only a select group of people get to go there, the 144,000, well, then Jesus is a liar. And we know that God cannot lie, and we also know that Jesus is God. There's right. another problem that the JWs have is that doctrine there. Now, who are, again, what is the point of the sermon? We're talking about 144,000. We're working our way through this kind of debunking this false doctrine of who they are who they aren't. And we do believe that they are a very uh, particular group of people. They're a literal 144,000 men. Well, who are they? They are a distinct group of Old Testament Israelites. They are Old Testament Israelites who got saved in the Old Testament the same way everybody else has ever gotten saved, by faith, through grace, by putting their faith in God, by believing in, in the promise of God. That's how you get saved, and not of their own righteousness, just like it was said of Abraham, that he believed in God and was counted unto him for righteousness. Amen. It's the same way everyone's ever gotten saved throughout all of the Bible. We don't believe in dispensations here. Right. We don't believe that they had to work their way into heaven, the Old Testament, that they are saved the way that mankind has always been saved, and that's through faith. So we believe that these 144,000 are actually, I mean, you have to think about it. People are getting, because again, we don't believe in this doctrine that uh, you know, that the Old Testament saints went to a place called Abraham's bosom, the nice side of hell, you know, where it's a little cooler, and in, our, in our, you know, a holding cell until they were allowed into heaven. You know, for that we don't believe that. We believe that they, when the, you know, to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. That has always been the case. Yes. So think about it. If all these Old Testament Israelites who are saved are dying, like everyone, right? They're going to go to heaven too. So it, it really it makes perfect sense. You can see how this false doctrine of dispensationalism just throws off everything. I mean, if you believe this false doctrine of dispensationalism, you have a hard time maybe explaining these Old Testament. They'll, they'll sit here and tell you that these 144,000 are Jews that are presently living on the earth. And we're going to deal with that here in a minute. But we believe that the 144,000 are a distinct group of Old Testament Israelites who are saved by faith. Amen. And the Bible's real clear about that. If you go back to Revelation chapter 7, I mean, it's it's crystal clear. It's plain. It's right on, as, as the nose on your face. It's as plain as the nose on your face. It's right there on the surface. It says right here, in verse 4, Revelation 7, And I heard the number of them which were sealed, and there were sealed and 144,000 of all the tribes of the children of Israel. That's who it is. They're the children of the tribes of Israel. They're not... They're not, you know, Christian. You wouldn't say that they're just Gentiles. You wouldn't say that they're believing Greeks or, or, or anything like that. It says that they are the children of the tribes of Israel. Now, so the question then becomes: Do any of the tri of these tribes exist today? The answer is no. Now you have to remember: look, people even make the argument, well, there might be a few tribes that can still identify themselves, you know. And and I I highly skeptical of that. That they're even then. That, that, that the, the tribes have been so dispersed and so intermingled with the heathen and, and other nations that no one can say that they are of a pure bloodline yep. going back, you know, nearly 7,000 years. I mean, you know, for at least 4,000 years going back that far, thousands of years, and saying that they've kept this just pure bloodline all the way down through the ages. Highly skeptical. And especially when the fact in the Bible tells us that God scattered them into all nations and that God has, uh, you know, even in the Old Testament we see, you know, the vast majority of those tribes, the northern kingdoms, just being intermingled with the heathen immediately yep. and becoming what's known as the Samaritans. So, you know, Judah, Benjamin, and the Levites, I mean, those were really the only ones that you, you might be able to say, maybe with a glimmer of possibility, just a, a shred of possibility, that maintained their identity. Just those three, after the kingdom was divided. I mean, that's where you get the term Jews, right? Just meaning they were from the southern kingdom of Judah. That's where, you, that's where that term comes from. 
Jews does not apply to all 12 tribes. Right. That's why I use the term Israelites. That is what refers to all 12 tribes. They were the sons of Israel. And again, verses, uh, we won't read it for sake of time, but Revelation chapter 7, verses 5 through 8, not only does it say that they're the children of the tribes of Israel, it goes on and lists every tribe that they're from. It lists the 12 tribes. I mean, could it be any clearer that these are the Old Testament saints from the, tri from the children of Israel? So if the Bible's real clear about that, I don't think I really need to expound that. I don't, you know, if, if you're struggling with that, see me after the service and, and we'll read it a little slower for you and you can get that. But it's real clear the Bible is saying that the children of the tribes of Israel. Now, what I really, the point of the sermon though is this, this morning is, as the title said, the example of the, old, of the 144,000. The example of the 144,000. See, I think there's certain attributes that we can, we can, uh, we can look at of these 144,000 and apply to our own lives. Because here's the thing, with this 144,000, you know, I think sometimes, and that's why these false doctrines kind of come up, that, that, that you know, it's, it's really special and unique to be a part of them, and it is. You know, that's something to be coveted almost, that it's something that we should, uh, you know, as Jehovah's Witnesses would teach you, just, it's something you should strive after, it should be something that you try to attain unto. But, you know, so we can kind of get this attitude or this idea that the 144,000 are this elite group that are, you know, that they're better than everybody else. Well, it's just that they're, they have a unique purpose, you know, in the end times. And God has just used them in a unique way. I don't think he's trying to lift them up and exalt them and say that they're any better than anybody else. And when we look at their attributes, in fact, we will see that we share many things in common with them already. And that there are things that we could learn from them that we should be uh, have in common with them. Now, one of the first things, um, <clears throat> you know, if you would turn over to Revelation chapter 14, where we started. So, you know, the point is, you know, we will not be of this number. You know, get marked down. I don't care how good of a Christian you are. You will never be a part of the 144,000. That's right. You know, so give up on that dream. You know, set a new goal. It's not going to happen. Um, <clears throat> it's just not going to happen. But here's the thing. We can have, and already do in some ways, the same attributes as this 144,000. I mean, if you just have to be one of the few, the proud, the 144,000, I got good news for you. you, can, you well, I got bad news and good news. Bad news is you can't, you know. I don't care how long you spend in, in, the, in the Jewish boot camp or whatever like that. It's not going to happen. You're going to have to, but the good news is, is that you can have some of the attributes that they have. Now, it says here in Revelation chapter 14, verse 1, let's kind of break this down here. It says, I looked, and behold, a lamb stood on the Mount Sion, and with him in 144,000, having their father's name written in their foreheads. So again, what are some of the attributes of them? Well, one of the first things that we can see here in verse in verse one is that they stood with the Lamb. They stood with the Lamb. When John looked up and saw these 144,000, where were they? They were standing with the Lamb. And who is the Lamb? The Lamb is Jesus. He is the Lamb that's slain from the foundation of the world. <clears throat> so that's something that we should have in common with these people, that we are willing to stand with Jesus. That we are willing to stand and be identified as a Christian. That we'd be willing to stand and be identified as one who believes in Jesus Christ. Amen. One who believes the Bible. And that's becoming more and more important today. And more and more difficult to do without suffering consequences. Because as we live in a world that becomes more hostile to the, towards the things of God, more hostile to Christianity that, that, that we live, we're going that making that stand is going to cost us more and more. I mean, if you've read the book of Revelation, you know it, it gets to a point where it actually starts to cost people their head. Yeah. Literally. And, uh, you know, so that's something, that's an attribute that we should strive to have in our lives now. That we would stand with Jesus. That we would not be ashamed of Him. Now, I'm not going to say that's easy all the time. I'm not, you know, in America, we've got it pretty good so far. I mean, we have people that get upset. You know, they call the church and they complain about us leaving, knocking on their door and putting flyers and we're littering. You know, we ignore their no soliciting signs and knock on their door and we upset them and disturb their perfect and peaceful life. You know, in suburbia. Well, you know, I, I think, I, you know, that's not much of a stand to take, I, quite frankly. I don't think that we're really, you know, that's, we're not going to go down in Fox's books of, Book of Martyrs over that, you know. He ignored every no solicitor. <laughs> he, he, he knocked till his knuckles were wrong. I bled from these knuckles for Christ, you know, knocking on those doors, right? It's, it's just not going to happen. It's, it's a pretty, but you know, some people, that, that right, that one, it's, Sad to say, but something as simple as that can dissuade them. You know, especially if they're newer to soul winning, they'll go, oh, the no soliciting sign. Oh, no. 
What are we going to do? And I know it was like that for me at first. I was actually nervous about it. Like, how are they going to react? Now I look at them and I go, I can't wait to see how they react. I really can't. And now, and now they're, even in some of the neighborhoods up in Phoenix, now they're getting the ones where it's not just like, you know, you have the little narrow ones, there's no sliss. Now they have ones that they're, it's like, it's like a warning sign. It's like black and white. I'm surprised there isn't like a little, like, picture of a stick man, like one yelling at the other, you know. <laughs> but it says, you know, no soliciting, this includes religious, blah, blah, blah. And it just, like lists everything that they don't want to have anything to do with. You know, now they used to have the ones that are real decorative that kind of make a joke out of it. We found Jesus, we own a vacuum. Unless you have cookies, go away. That kind of, unless you're selling cookies, we're not interested. I'll knock those two. Now it's just like a placard, like don't feed the bears. You know, the buffalo or heat, don't get out of your car. You go through Yellowstone, right? And it's like that, no soliciting. And I, when I did, I saw that the other day, it was, and it was on a gate. Like, it wasn't even near the door. It's like zip ties around it. You could tell the guy went out there. Took the time to go down to Home Depot, Ace Hardware, wherever, get the zip ties, get the sign, pay for it, come home, put that thing on there, and thought, just, oh, I got up, and then, then I come along. <laughs> and the he comes along and says, oh, I'm going to go trigger this guy. And I go up to his door, and knock on it, hey, we're from Faith Ward Baptist Church. I'm polite about it. And he just looks at me, did you see the sign? Yeah. Yes, sir. <laughs> just like that, yes, sir, I saw it. And he says, have a good day. <laughs> anyway. But I'm just saying, you know, like, is that, is that the consequences that we fear of having to upset somebody with an else listening sign? They might leave a, they might leave a nasty voicemail on the church, the church's Google voice, you know, that, you know, only one or two people might go through every once a week and actually listen to, you know. And once we see all the expletives in the text, we just delete it and don't listen anyway. So, anyway, <laughs> there will be consequences for standing with Jesus, though. I'm not saying that. You know, living for God and living for Christ is not without consequences, and that we shouldn't. But we shouldn't allow that to stand uh, to stop us from living for, for Jesus. Way we should be willing to be like one hundred forty-four thousand and stand with Jesus, no matter what, whether it's easy or hard. Amen. Jesus said, "I also I say unto you, whosoever shall confess me before men, him shall the Son of Man also confess before the angels of God. But he that denieth me before men shall be denied before the angels of God." You know. I, you know, you could say maybe that applies to salvation. I personally believe he's actually talking about people who are you know, receiving rewards in heaven. You know, they're going to be denied. Others will be confessed. And others will be denied in heaven. You know, you're not going to get that praise. You're not going to get that reward. And here's the thing about standing with Jesus. There is no neutral ground. Some people will say, well, you know, I really just don't want to get involved. But Christians, you know, I'm, just, I'm not against Jesus, but, you know, I'm not going to be seen standing with him. You know, I don't want to be, I don't want to take that stand. I just don't want to, I, want, I don't want to be part of that fight. But Jesus said in Luke 11, he that is not with me is against me. Right. So if you're not standing with Jesus, and I, you know, I don't know how to explain it to you, how that works, that's what Jesus said though. And he said that if you are not with him, you are against him. That there's no middle ground. You know, you can't, it's not, you know, if you're in a civil war, you can't put on the, the, the blue coat and the gray pants and just stand in the middle and, not, and hope not to not get shot on the battlefield. You know, you have to choose a side. <laughs> and he said, goes on and says, He that gathereth not with me, scattereth. You know, so if you're not gathering with him, you're actually, it's not that you're not doing anything, you're actually scattering. And I don't know how to explain that. You know, that's probably a, another sermon could, could do, I, we could write about that and, and expound that more. But we should be willing to stand with Jesus like he's 144,000. And if we do that, if you would, keep some Revelation 14, we'll be the rest of the morning. We go back to Revelation chapter 1. If we decide to stand for Jesus, let me tell you something, it might be hard, it might be difficult, we might have to suffer some persecution, you know, more, more than just the nasty phone call, more than just the rude person at the door, we might actually have to cost us something, you know, more than just family being upset with us, more than just friends, you know, looking at us cross-eyed because they, you know, they think that we're weird now or something like that. <laughs> it might actually cost us something, but if it does cost you something, if it comes to the point where it costs you being in prison, it costs you being exiled, it costs you something in your life, well, you'll be in good company. You know, if you stand with Jesus, you're in good company. Look here in Revelation chapter 1, verse 9. I, John, who also am your brother and companion in tribulation. John knew something about tribulation, didn't he? He goes on and says, In the kingdom and patience of Jesus Christ was in the isle called Patmos. Now, he wasn't on vacation. He didn't go on a cruise and end up on Patmos and decide to write a letter. He was exiled in Patmos. It was a place where they would send people to go and die. <clears throat> he was in the isle that's called Patmos for the word of God and for the testimony 
of Jesus Christ. He was willing to stand with Jesus to the point where it caused him to be exiled, to be cast out, and to be put away from everybody else. I mean, we would all want to be known as, as John. John had that great title, the disciple whom Jesus loved. Yeah. Now, I'm not saying Jesus doesn't love, love you, but I mean, there's, there's Jesus loves you, and then there's like, you know, you're one of his close companions. I mean, John at the Last Supper was leaning upon Jesus' breast, I and mean, he was right there with Jesus. He was close to him. And uh, we, would all want, we would all want that for ourselves, I would hope. But are we willing to go as far as John did? Are we willing to stand to the point where it would cost us something? That's what it's going to take. We'll go ahead and move on here. Again, what are some of the attributes of the 144,000 that we can learn from? It says here in verse 1 that they, uh, they, were, they stood on the Mount Zion with the Lamb and, and the 144,000 having their Father's name written in their foreheads. So that's another great attribute that we should and could have in, com in common with them. Having the Father's name written in their foreheads. Well, you know, symbolically we could say well, that's kind of like having God on your mind. You know, having God on your mind. Meditating upon the Word of God. thinking, Letting the, letting the Word of God and the things of God fill your mind. Now that, let that be upon your mind. That's an attribute that we should have in our lives, like these 144,000. We should meditate upon the Word of God. I'll read for you from Psalms chapter 119. Go to Colossians chapper 3. Keep from Revelation 14, go to Colossians 3. The Bible says in Psalm 119, I have seen all the end of perfection, but thy commandment is exceeding broad. Oh, how I love thy law. It is my meditation all the day. I mean, can we say that like the psalmist? That we love God's Word? That we love the law? We have a lot of Christians so-called today that they want to dismiss the law. Oh, that's the Old Testament. That's just the law. The law of God is perfect. The law, the law of good is, the law is perfect converting the soul. The law of the Lord is, is good. And he said, I love the law. That's an exclamation point in that verse. It is my meditation all the day. I mean, can we say that? That we meditate upon the law of God, the words of God, the commandments of God all the day? We should. Thou will keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on thee. We all want peace. But do we stay our mind on God? Do we say like 144,000 that he is on our minds, that we have his name written on our foreheads? Look at Colossians chapter 3. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly with all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. So there again, letting the word of God dwell, the word of Christ, the word of God, well in you richly. Let it be on your mind and in your heart and on your tongue. That's an attribute that we can have. Now, what's great about Colossians 3 is not only does it show us that attribute of having the Word of God in your mind, but also our next attribute, which is, uh, if you look there it, it, towards the end, it says, uh, verse, uh, chapter Colossians 3, verse 16, Let the Word of God Christ dwell in you richly with all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. So it's not just having the Word of God on you, but there's actually an outpouring. There's something that comes out of you as well. Now that Word of God dwells in you, stays in there, but there's also something that comes out of your mouth and your lips. And what is it? Psalms, hymns, spiritual songs, singing with grace in your heart unto the Lord. <clears throat> and it says that we are to teach and admonish one another in psalms. You know, and so it's not just you know in your heart and it stays there. We're also to admonish one another with these, with these songs. <clears throat> I mean, isn't that a blessing to us? When we, you know, I know there's... Certain uh, uh, times I like to go listen to people singing, you know, singing the, 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 the hymns of the faith, singing the, the, the songs. Sometimes when I'm in church up in Phoenix, you know, I'll always try to participate, but sometimes every now and then I like to just listen. I like just to listen to hear God's people and just listen to it. It blesses my heart. But if we all just kept it in our heart, the singing, well, then I wouldn't have that. You know, we wouldn't be able to admonish one another. But it leads us to our next attribute there in a... Uh, Revelation 14, verse 3, it says, And they sung, as it were, a new song before the throne and before the four beasts and the elders. So they were ones that sang. These men, they, these 144,000, that's an attribute that we can and should have are being people that sing, people that are willing to sing out. You know, and that's, that's, a, a, that's a commandment from God. In fact, it is the number one commandment from God. There, it's the one that's repeated the most out of all, all the commandments of God to praise God, to praise the Lord. The Bible says in Psalm 149, Praise ye the Lord, sing unto the Lord a, a new song, and His praise in the congregation of saints. 
it says in Psalm 149, again, it says a new song in the congregation of the saints. You know, we should be singing in the congregation. It says here of these 444,000 that they sang before the throne, didn't it? It says they sang before the beasts and the elders. Now, it doesn't mean that they were taking their turn. It means that they were in front of them, singing before them, that they were able to see them singing. And that's the same attitude we should have when we come into church, to be people that are willing to sing out before others and not just... You know, mumble through, you know, uh, him. That's right. And you say, "Well, I'm new to the faith. I don't, I don't know these songs. These are all new to me." Perfect. It says right there, "Sing to the Lord a new song." Right. So these are all new to you. So you can, you can still keep that commandment. You can sing unto the Lord a new song in the congregation of the saints. <clears throat> now we have just as much reason to sing as they did, don't they? I mean, they're standing with the Lamb. They're up in heaven. I mean, obviously they're singing because they, they want to. It's in their heart. But let me tell you something. We have just as much reason as the 144,000 to sing. The Bible says, I will sing unto the Lord because He has dealt bountifully with me. Amen. I mean, can we not say that about ourselves, that God has dealt bountifully with us? Amen. You know, I couldn't help it. Yesterday, I, I, was, I was on my way home, and it was I was in Arizona. It was a nice, breezy 80 degrees. I had the window down. <clears throat> Everything was in bloom. You know, there's all these beautiful flowers blooming around me. It smelled nice. I was going home to my beautiful wife and children. I walk in and there's there's a chicken homemade chicken pot pie in the oven. The place smells great, tastes great. I mean, I had to stop and think and go, man, God has been bountiful with me. You know, I'm not living in some you know shack with a dirt floor, you know, flipping over rocks and eating bugs. You know, I'm not I'm not scrounging for my meal. God has dealt very bountifully with me. You know, if you're living in the United States, you could probably say that about yourself. And that's a reason to sing, isn't it? I will sing unto the Lord. Why? Because He hath dealt bountifully with me. Psalm 95 says, Oh, come, let us sing unto the Lord. Let us make a joyful noise to the rock of our salvation. I mean, if you've been saved today, that's a reason to sing. We have just as much reason to sing as these men. It goes on and says there in Revelation chapter 14 that they were... It says in verse uh, <clears throat> no, no. I just started in verse two, and I heard a voice from heaven, and the voice of many waters, and the voice of a great thunder, and I heard the voice of harpers harping with their harps, and they sung a new song, as it was a song before the throne and before the beasts and the elders, and no man could learn that song with the hundred forty-four thousand which were redeemed from the earth. Now, are we, don't we have that in common with them? Are we not also redeemed from the earth? Did God not also redeem us in Christ? Of course He did. So here's another attribute that, you know, everyone wants to, you know, they think this is some elite group that they would love, you know, the JWs want to go so far to teach false doctrine about it. You know, but we see here that we have so many of these attributes already in common with these people. And one of them is that we are redeemed in Christ. The Bible says in Galatians 3 that Christ hath redeemed us from the curse of the law being made a curse for us as it is written. So, you know, Christ has already redeemed us. We we could be just we are just the same as they redeemed from the earth. <clears throat> I'm running out of time here, so I'm just going to move along here, but what's another one of these attributes? It says that they were redeemed from the earth. Look at verse 4. These which were they are they which were not defiled with women, for they are virgins. These are they which follow the lamb whithersoever they go. They follow the lamb. I mean, is that not something we should have in common with these people? And this is something that we should have in common with 144,000. This is an attribute. This is an example of them, that, from them, that we need to learn. You see, following the Lamb, following Christ, that's what makes a disciple a disciple. That's really what it means to be a disciple, to follow somebody, to put yourself under their teaching, and to learn from them. So that's something that we need to do. Now, it's, I won't turn you back to Revelation 7, but it's, it's interesting there. It says that they were not to hurt the earth and the sea of the trees until they sealed what? What did they call the 144,000 in Revelation 7? They called them the servants of our God. Yep. So these, these elite men, these, these, this special group of people, these very unique people in Scripture, what are they? Well, they're servants. It says that they are the servants of our God. And that's what we need to be. If we want to be... You know, have an attribute, have something in common with these men. We need to follow God. We need to be His servants. Now, let me say this: If that was easy, everyone would do it. If that was easy, everybody would do it. I mean, it's not exactly a packed house in here. You know, we're not exactly busting at the seams because there's a lot of other places where you can go 
And someone will just tell you that, you know, God doesn't expect much from you. You know, that, that you know, following Christ is just, you know, to be, a, to be a, a follower of Christ just means to have a warm, fuzzy feeling in your heart and to go to church once a week and, you know, you don't have to worry about reading the book or, you know, doing anything else besides that. Just go and, you know, and lift your hands in the air and sway back and forth and enjoy the, the fog and the purple lights and just repeat, you know, uh, holy, 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 just, you know, innumerable, whatever it is they sing there. I can't remember. It's been so long since I've been to those, those dumb churches. As the deer panted through the water, you know these emotional, just get you going songs, and that's it. And you're a disciple, you're a follower of the Lamb. You're you're just you're just one of God's servants. You know, a servant is somebody who actually goes out and serves. Right. They actually put some sweat into it, put some effort and some toil into what they're doing. You know, it requires something from you. It's not easy to always be a servant. <clears throat> the Bible says in Mark 10, and then Jesus beholding. Him loved him, talking about the rich young ruler who came to him, and he said unto him, One thing thou lackest, go thy way, sell whatsoever thou hast, and give to the poor, and thou shalt have treasure in heaven, and come, take up thy cross, and follow me. Well, that sounds like a little much, to take up thy cross and follow him. That sounds like work. That sounds like following Christ. It means being a servant. He said in Luke 9, He said to them all, If any man, if any man will come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. For whosoever will save his life shall lose it, but whosoever will lose his life for my sake shall find it. The, the, for my sake the same shall save it. See, so it actually costs you something to follow Christ. To be a follower of the Lamb, to be a servant of God. You know, there's a cross that you have to bear. There's work, there's effort that goes into it. <clears throat> and people like to fool themselves into thinking they're following when in fact they're not. They want to say, oh, I'm a servant, I'm a disciple, I follow Christ. They want to trick themselves. They want somebody to get up and tell them, oh yeah, you sweet, precious thing. You know, you're doing everything that God wants you to do. When in fact, they're not doing anything. They're not taking any stands. They're not living by the book. They don't have any standards in their life. They're not serving God. They're not going out and doing anything for Christ whatsoever. And one way we can kind of, uh, you know, test this, whether or not we are following God, is we can ask ourselves one simple question. Are we winning souls? Are we trying to win souls? be it the souls of our children, the souls of the lost that are out in the world, our family, our friends, are we trying to get them to Christ? Because the Bible said, Jesus said, if you follow me, I will make you fishers of men. That if you follow me, you will be a fisher of men. That if you're following Christ, I mean, that is the work of Christ. That is what we are put here to do. To fish for the souls of men. To go out and catch men. Not literally, right? But to get them saved. Yeah. That's what it's talking about there. <clears throat> Jesus said, if you continue in my word, then are you my disciples in me. You know, if we're, if we're following the book, if we're trying to live for God, if we're trying to do the things that the, the Bible tells us to do, and we're winning souls, then we know that we are the servants of God, and that we are following the Lamb, just as these 144,000 are. Now, one of the last uh, attributes I want to look at here is the fact that it says there, um, <clears throat> towards the end, I think I skipped over one of them, but it says here towards the end. Um, let me just get get to that spot there. Look at verse five. <clears throat> and in their mouth was found no guile. Well, that's an attribute we should definitely have, yeah. and that's actually probably one that might take a little bit more more work than the others. That might be one that we have to kind of watch and and, and look out for. And you know, guile isn't just you know. It's not just saying that, you know, they don't say dirty words. You know, it's, it's, it's actually, guile is a lot worse than that. Guile is something, um, you know, I, the first time we see it is in Exodus. And I'll just read to you. It says here in Exodus 21, And if a man lie not in wait, but God deliver, but, but God deliver him into his hand, that I will appoint a place whither he shall flee. So he's talking about if a man kills another man, right? What happens when that happens? That if you, if, you know, when another person kills another person. He says, and if a man... Lie not in wait, meaning he's not standing there. You know, it's not premeditated. It's something that just happened. It's a crime of passion. It was an accident. Then he says, I will appoint a place whither he shall flee, so that the avenger of blood doesn't come and shed his blood. And it goes on and says in verse 14, But if, if a man come presumptuously, premeditated, presumptuous, presuming to do this thing, right? Upon his neighbor to slay him with what? With guile, it says. To slay him with guile. Thou shalt take him from mine altar that he may die. 
so guile is a pretty strong word. And when it says that in his mouth was found no guile, I mean, it's an element of premeditated murder. That's what the Bible is teaching us here. That's, that's how, uh, how guile plays a part. The Bible says in Psalm 32, Blessed is the man unto whom the Lord imputeth not iniquity, and in whose spirit there is no guile. So guile is not something we want to have in our heart or in our, in our, in our minds or in our spirit. And what is guile? Guile is just cunningness. It's being very sly. It's being trickery. You know, it's, it's trickery. It's trying to trick somebody. You know, like, hey, come on over and here, here have, have a glass of this. You know, or I won't tell you there's rat poison in it. You know, it's, it's premeditated murder, this kind of thing. They're, they're tricking people and getting them into a place where they can do harm to them. And that's what the guile is. And he's saying that there's no guile in their mouth. They're not using their mouth to try and hurt people and to, and to trick them. And really, you know, the being without guile, you know, it's great that God praises these men for that, but it has its own merits here on the earth. You know, it says in Psalm 34, it says, What man is he that desireth life and loveth many days that he may say good? You know, every hand would go up, right? Everyone would say, yeah, I desire life. You know, I love many, I love many days, and I want to see some good while I'm here. You know, that, that's, that's what they would want. Well, it says here, keep thy tongue from evil and thy lips from speaking guile. You know, if that's what you want for your life, to see many days and to, and to have that which is good in your life, well, then you need to keep your tongue from evil and from speaking guile. It says, depart from evil and do good. Seek peace and pursue it. See, guile in Scripture is something that's often associated with speech. It's something that is often associated with the words that are coming out of people's mouths. Go ahead and turn over to 1 uh, Peter chapter 3. 1 Peter chapter 3. You're going to 1 Peter 3. I'm going to read to you from 1 Peter chapter 2. It says, Wherefore, laying aside all malice. And what is malice? I mean, that's you know, doing somebody harm. You know, going out of your way. That's like maliciousness. You know, you're not just, it wasn't an accident. You're actually going out of your way to inflict harm on somebody. Wherefore, lay aside all malice and all guile and hypocrisies and envies and, e and all evil speakings. And as newborn babes desire the so miracle of the word that you may grow thereby. So we see here again that guile is something that's being associated with what's coming out of your mouth. Something that's it's, 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 it's uh, being spoken. Look at 1 Peter chapter 3. Verse 8. It says, Finally, be of all of one mind, having compassion one of another. Love as brethren, be pitiful, be courteous, not rendering evil for evil or railing for railing, but contrarywise, blessing, knowing that ye are thereunto called, that ye should inherit a blessing. For he that will love life and see good days, does that sound familiar? Let him refrain his tongue from evil, and that his lips speak no guile. And that's Psalm 32 right there again. Let him skew evil and do good, and let him seek peace and ensue it. <clears throat> so we see that that's an attribute that we are commanded to have in Scripture. And it's one of the many attributes that the 144,000 had. You know, there's a lot of attributes that they had that we could have like them. You know, what were some of them? You know, that we, our lips would speak no guile. You know, and that we would stand with the Lamb. That we'd be willing to stand with God. That we'd be followers of the Lamb. And that we'd be willing to go out and serve God and be servants of His. And really, the 144,000, they set the example. How did they, how did they get to such a special place? You know, how, did, how is it? How, did they, how is it that this morning that they are set as an example to us? As something that we should be like, that we should have these same attributes as them. Well, they set the example by following the example, which is Christ. Yeah. Christ is the ultimate example. What does it say about him? That in his mouth was found no guile. So it's, a, and it's an attribute not only that they have, but it's one that Christ has. So the 144,000, they aren't just this like elite, superior group of people that you know somehow are just separate from us and that we have nothing in common with and that, that they're just going to get special treatment and that they're better than us. They're actually, yes, they're a special group. They're a limited number of people, literally, and they're a very unique group that, in the fact that they come from the Old Testament, but they have the same attributes that we do already, that we are redeemed from the earth, that our lips should speak no guile, and that we should you know, have, the, have all these same attributes as them. So we should follow their example so that we can be like the ultimate example, which is Christ. Let's go ahead and pray.